man, kids, they just giggle at everything. I wish I could live my life like that. I could use a lot more giggling. How's everyone doing? Would you guys all just giggle for me on, on command? I think, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, it's great to have everybody out. Uh, really glad to have you here at Joy Church. If you haven't been here before, like I say, Many times when I get up here, we are scientifically proven to be the best church that ever was or ever will be, so thank you for coming. If we can help with anything, make sure that you're comfortable, you've got what you need, you know what's going on around here, feel free to grab one of us. Lots of us have these lanyards on. I don't have one, but I'm pointing to where it would be if I did have one, and it would say, I can help, and we wear those because hope we can, we can help, hopefully, unless you ask me, because I probably won't know the answer, but <laughs> welcome. There's a story about a guy on a subway, and he's, he's on this, this train car on the subway, and he's got these, these children with him, I don't know, two or three kids, and he sits down, and his kids are running around, and they're just running amok. They're going all over the place. They're shrieking. They're making noise. They're giggling madly, like probably like the group of children that just left. And How many of you know when it's not your kids doing that, you know, it's other kids that are making a stink, and they're fighting, and they're punching, because everything comes down to punching when you're a child. When it's someone else's kids doing that, and you're just trying to have a quiet, just peaceful ride, you're mean mugging the kids, you know, you're looking away. You look, eventually you start mean mugging the dad. Toby's back there like, yeah. Toby, you just start out at mean mugging. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you don't get to there, you don't graduate to there, you just start there. You're like, yeah, all right, who's gonna get it today? And if you're really in trouble, you get the mom glare, you know, and some of us guys try that, it doesn't come out right. So these kids are running amok. They're going crazy on this subway, and people are trying to sleep. They're trying to be quiet, and they're like mean mugging the dad, you know? Like, why are you not solving this problem? Like, these kids are bumping into us. They're knocking stuff over. They're yelling. They're screaming. They're fighting. They're punching. They're, and, and, and you're just staring blissfully out the window, just watching the scenery pass by. Dad, why are you not taking care of this? And finally, someone gets up, and they approach dad, and say, they say, sir, mister, guy, uh, your kids are kind of, they're, they're making a ruckus. It's loud, it's annoying, it's frustrating. We all notice it, why don't you notice it? Why haven't you taken care of this problem? And the guy looks at him and says, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, am, I am out of it. I, 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 I didn't even realize it. We just came from the hospital and I guess the kids don't know how to react and either do I. Um, their mom just passed away, just now, we're on our way home. Now immediately like the emotional pitch changes right like you're upset you're frustrated you're mean mugging you're you're glaring you're 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 like dude we all see this problem you don't see it but the second that you walk over there and you say you know you know try to bust this guy and and set things straight and he tells you the reason all of a sudden everything in your life changes right I mean, you'd have to be quite the heartless individual to be like, I don't care, keep your kids quiet. Toby, just don't say anything. <laughs> right, all of a sudden, the, the way that you feel, the what you brought some assumptions to the table. You assumed that this guy was being irresponsible. You assumed his kids were jerks. You're probably right about that. Um, you assumed all of these things were going on, and the second you go over there and you actually inquire, you actually get close to the situation, you bring your assumptions out into the open, and then the guy responds with something like that, oh, there, there's actually a reason, I, I'm sorry, like, we, we're just, our world is totally blown up right now. Um, and I, I, didn't even, I didn't even know this was happening. You're, the, the whole script just flips. Like, you, you, you're in a totally, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. How can we help you? How can we take care of you? Oh, I, can I pray for you? I, I, I'm so sorry for your loss. And all of a sudden, it's completely, it's totally different. Why does it change like that? Perspective. Perspective. And we started talking about perspective last week, and there's still meat on them bones. We were digging where there were potatoes. Potatoes. Digging where them's taters. And if you don't know what meat on them bones means, just eat ribs with my daughter Madeline because she will eat them bones until there is no meat. We're talking barbecue sauce in the eyebrows. I mean, just like the whole nine yards. There's just so much when it comes to perspective. There's so much when it comes to how we look at things, the angle, the lens that we use to look at the world. And we started looking, about, or we started looking at this idea 
last week. We were talking about the rich young ruler, but there's an interesting study that I found. It was done by Gallup in 2011, and they asked people, just random people, what do you think your yearly income would need to be for you to consider yourself rich? Right? We're talking in the context of money. This series is called In, in Blank We Trust or In Question Mark We Trust um, and talking about how we spend our money. And, and so we're picking this up from last week. But this poll was asking, how much yearly income do you think that you would need? And what was interesting about this is it almost completely came down to perspective. Almost, almost completely. So people who were uh, making 30,000-ish dollars a year, what they thought you needed in order to be rich, for them to consider rich, was about twice what they were making. So 60, 70 grand, something like that. The people who were making 60 or 70,000, for them, they considered the people to be rich, those who were making about twice as much as they were. For people who were making half a million dollars a year, they did not consider themselves to be rich. It was the people who were making around twice as much. Anybody ever experienced the moving target of riches before? The moving target of, of career opportunities and income, and you're like, oh man, if I could just get to here, and then you get there, and you're like, oh, it's about the same. Man, it's like my bills just came with me. It's like this kind of moving target. If I can just get to this amount, if I can just get here, if I can just get to this next spot, then I'll really have got somewhere. Anybody, anybody experienced that before? It's because wealth and, and prosperity and riches and kind of how we feel about money and where we're at, it comes down to perspective. It comes down to a way of, of thinking. What's funny is that it, this, there's a, a whole couple of books written on this. One of them's called Millionaire Mindset. One of them's called Millionaire Next Door. And what they do is they, they survey actual millionaires, people who are multi-multi-millionaires. And what they find out is typically these people are living way, way, way below their means. Usually they drive a car that's like 12 years old. Some of you are like, dang, my car's newer than that. They, drive, they, they live in houses that are not grossly overpriced. Most of them have a bunch of equity in their home. They wear normal clothes. Like a lot of perceptions about what we think that people who actually make good income do are wrong because it's perspective. How many of you are like, dang, I ain't making that much money. I'm making way less than that. How many of you ever, just be honest, when you think about someone who's a multi-multi-millionaire, when you think about them, you're like, you know, they're pretty terrible at being rich. <laughs> if I was that rich, I would have some things. Like, I don't, I, if I was to be rich, I would probably drive one of these guys around. I mean, why wouldn't you have <laughs> this crusty old 80s monster truck limo? I mean, you just have to ask yourself, why, why not? Like, these people are driving, a, uh, like, this junky old car around. You could be driving that. You could be wearing these. Go to the gold-plated Jordans. These are $37,000. <laughs> Better have, a, have them in a few colors, you know? <laughs> but if you think gold shiny things are something, go to the, this is a statement piece right there. Now, if you got this thing, I'm telling you what. If you were rich and you have something like that right there, you are making a statement. You know what that statement is? I'm not, I don't even want to say it. I don't even, I'll just let your mind go to where, where it goes. How many of you think, you get this picture off the board, please. This is going to be too distracting. How many of you think, boy, I don't even have the money that those people have, but I would be way better at being rich than they are. They just live normal lives. They just get up and they just kind of do their work and they're, they're not super flashy or fancy or anything like that. It's perspective. It's perspective. Uh, I talk about this fairly often. The place that I like to go to gain perspective, to, to see what other people have seen, there are people who compile books of, of what people talk about on their deathbed. Now, how can you get better perspective than someone looking back over their whole life and they're saying, I really wish I would have blank. And usually what they say, almost without fail, like the highest percentages are they say that I wish I wouldn't have been so worried about money and I wish I would have spent more time with my family and my friends. The, always, every survey, the like, top two. I, none of them are like, boy, I wish I would have stayed an extra couple hours at the office every day. Boy, I wish I would have had a gold-plated pair of Jordans. I mean, it's just, most of it is, I wish I wouldn't have worried so much and I would have spent that time doing something that was more meaningful. And what's interesting about this is if you go to many, many, many third world countries, places where they have, uh, you know, they make a dollar a day or $2 a day, they have just very, very little. They do not have 
big houses. Sometimes they don't have houses at all. They don't have vehicles. They, I mean, lots of places you go, uh, if you're going to India, Cambodia, I mean, all kinds of places around the world, the first thing that will surprise you is just the abject poverty. And there's garbage in the streets, and there's not services that take care of those kinds of things. But when you get down to it and you spend some time with the people who live in those nations, oftentimes they take their dollar or their two dollars and they buy a little bit of food and they go home and they have family around and they have friends and they have food and laughter and a good time. And you would think when you show up at these places, that having the perspective of a Westerner, of a, of a rich country, that you'd be like, this is awful. But you find out that many of these people when you come down to it, are, are living a better and more meaningful life because they're always around family. They're always with their friends. They're, they don't even have enough to afford the distractions that oftentimes make our life worse. Perspective. Perspective. The way that we look at money, the way that we look at wealth. Listen to this verse out of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 10. Those who love money will never have enough. That's exactly what that poll shows from Caleb. No matter how much you have, it's going to take about twice as much for you to really feel like you're rich. The problem with that is when you start making twice as much, you still don't feel that way. You need twice as much as that number. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings happiness, brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Can I get an amen? Win the lottery. You will find you have so many friends you didn't even know that they existed. They're just coming out of the woodwork. Like Everybody wants to be your friend. So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? Ouch. Why do you got to talk like that, Bible? Jeez. Okay, let's look at Luke chapter 12 and just dig a little bit more taters out of the ground because Jesus is just so good at explaining what money is like, what wealth is like, and what, how we get it wrong so many times. And often this, this pursuit of wealth, this, this worry about money, often controls our life, and it controls our perspective. So the parable of the rich fool, Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Verse 14, but he, Jesus, said to him, man, if Jesus starts his sentence in a reply to you with man, and I have, I, I have a feeling Jesus wasn't like, man. I have a feeling Jesus was like, man? That's like a way different kind of man. You know what I'm saying? Like, you understand that. If, if you're like working with somebody, you're doing something, and they're like, man? You're like, I did something wrong. I don't know what it is. And I have a feeling that that's exactly what Jesus did. Because in this context, Jesus has been preaching about humongously important things. He's preaching about heaven and hell. He's preaching about salvation. He's preaching about the kingdom of God. He's preaching about being persecuted. I mean, like, really, really heavy stuff. And in the middle of this, this guy stands up and he's like, hey, Jesus, uh, my brother won't share with me. Man! How would you like to be that guy? Jesus is like... <laughs> Jesus makes a parable out of this guy. First point, if Jesus makes a parable out of your life, it's either a really good thing or a really bad thing. <laughs> Usually a really bad thing. And so Jesus responds to this, this guy. He goes, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Like, I I've been talking about something totally different. Uh, here I am telling you the, the most important things in the universe. I'm the son of God, and I am divulging the most important message that you could overhear. And you stand up, hey, my brother's not giving me money. Dude, man. Like, and I, I hate to say it, but oftentimes I think we are this guy. <laughs> Because Jesus might be saying some things to you. God might be trying to communicate very clearly, very important things to you. And we just go throughout our day, you know, never hear a thing. And then we're like, oh my gosh, we're almost out of money. Jesus, help me. I have a money problem. And he's like, man, I've been talking to you about this important stuff. The only time you want to talk to me is when you run out of money. I've been talking to you about important things. I've been trying to help you organize your life correctly. I've been trying to talk to you about things that have eternal impact and value, and you get scared about your money, and that's the only time you talk to me? That's what he says to this guy. Who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? 
Why, why do I occupy this position? Like, why, why, why are we talking about this? And so he makes a parable out of this guy, which is, watch out if that ever happens to you. <laughs> Don't be the, per, the guy who interrupts Jesus to ask for money. Verse 15, he says, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Take care. Be careful. Be wary. Be alert. Because this is a sneaky thing. Your life does not consist in the things that you have. It does not consist in your stuff. It does not consist in your money. And so if that's what your life is completely wrapped up around, your perspective is never going to be right. Beware. Take care. 16, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store all of these crops. And he said to him, I'll do this. He said to himself, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And most of us are like, that seems pretty normal. Yeah, okay. You had a great year. And I don't think that having a great year is bad. I, I do want to be careful to say, I don't think that wealth is bad. I don't think money is bad. I don't think that being very, very prosperous and having a lot of income and that sort of thing is bad at all. The Bible talks very, very glowingly about money in lots of contexts. It talks a lot about the love of money and what it does to us when we make it an end rather than a means. When we're, that's our main goal. That's our main desire. And so, up until this point, this guy is kind of okay. I mean, the Bible talks about it all the time. It says that it's, it's God who's enabled us to get wealth, that God adds riches and no sorrow with it. I mean, that, that God rains down and crops come up, and that's kind of how they talk in the Bible because they didn't trade paper money like we do. They didn't get direct deposit. They raised sheeps. You have to say sheeps, not sheep. They raised grain. They raised crops. And so it meant that this guy had a a great year. His land produced a lot. He made a lot of money. Everything is fine at this point until he goes, I'm going to, I'm going to spend this on myself. And listen how it says it in verse 19. It says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Read that again. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. When you have ample goods, when you have enough to take care of yourself for a long time, do you know what you don't need? You don't need to hit your knees in prayer and go, God, I need you just for daily bread. I absolutely need you to come through. I, 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 just, I can't live without you. And I really do believe that that's where God wants us. And that place of need, that place of of desire, that place of God, I have to have you. And some people have lots of money, and they are that way. And that's the way, that, how we should strive to be. But this guy is saying, I have what I need. I don't need God to come through. I don't need someone to save me. I have ample goods laid up. I have security. I can take care of myself. Everything is going to be cool. I'm going to relax. I'm going to stop working. I'm going to stop caring. I'm going to stop striving. I'm going to stop trying to build something. I'm just going to chill, and eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, just live for myself. I have what I need. I don't need somebody to take care of me. I don't need God to come through. Resources are good. Money's good. Everything is cool. I am going to live for myself. And unfortunately, all of this sounds an awful lot like what we call retirement. And I don't think retiring is a bad thing. <laughs> we should be able to retire. We should be able to cease from work before we're 1,000 years old. But this idea like I am just, I'm just working for the weekend. I'm just getting to the end where I can just quit everything and I don't have to answer to anybody and I don't have to depend on anybody. Really what I want is for all of my goods to just serve me and take care of me and my pleasures and my feelings and what I want to do. And God does not approve of that. Listen to this next sentence in verse 20. But God said to him, fool. 
That's worse than Jesus starting with man. <laughs> this is God saying fool with an exclamation point. <laughs> How many of you know that the, the worst level is if it's fool with three exclamation points? That's like, that's it. You're done at that point. God said to him, fool. Like, this is emotive. He is like yelling. He's, he's so frustrated. He's saying, fool. In another portion of scripture, Jesus is talking about if you call your brother a fool, if you call someone fool, and I know there's a lot of connotations with that word, needlessly, you're in danger of hellfire. If you're making a judgment about somebody and to the point that you're calling them a fool, and a fool, is, we use it in English kind of like Mr. T, you know, I pity the fool. It's like, it's like light. It's just saying, I don't like you. You're dumb, whatever. But there's, there's connotations in Scripture. But God is, he's worried enough about it to say fool to this guy. You are a fool. You are missing the boat here. This night, your soul is required of you, meaning you gon' die. That's not gonna, that's not going to, it's you gon' die. G-O-N, apostrophe, fool. Tonight your soul is required of you, and then the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Your stuff's not going to take care of you. Your savings account is not going to take care of you. All this stuff that you have amassed, you thought it was security, and it, maybe it was for this temporal life, but tonight this temporal life is over. Now you're passing into eternity, and you can't spend that currency here. We operate on a different sort of, of finance. So who cares about your stuff? It's all gone to you because you dead. Dead. That's all the way dead. <laughs> Verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Do you know that this can be you or me, even without being wealthy? Even without being rich, even without having great income, you can still be rich to yourself. And with much or with little, it doesn't really matter, with whatever resource you have, whatever money you have, whatever time, whatever attention and focus and love and devotion you have, you can be rich toward yourself or you can be rich toward God. But you can't be both. And God said, this is what it's like when you, everything is, is your hair and nails, your cool stuff, your possessions, your time, you, 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 you. See, I don't think God is condemning riches here. I don't think he's condemning prosperity. I don't think he's condemning making more than enough. I think this is a, is a heart issue. This is not a, an economy issue. This is where does your devotion lie? Where does your value lie? Where does your treasure lie? And I think that that's the answer. How are we rich towards God? Have you ever considered the irony that we put the words in God we trust on these small green pieces of paper that insulate us from actually trusting God? We're like, oh man, if I got enough of these things, I don't need to trust in God anymore. Well, let's, let's print something on there so we can trick him. He'll never know. In God we trust. Woo, feeling good about that. All right, I'm just going to take these and spend them all on myself. <laughs> The idea of the gospel is that the very best of heaven, that God himself, God who deserved absolutely no sin and no shame and no punishment for anything, would walk the earth and suffer and take on what we deserve. That he would pay the price that we owed. That the, the price of us breaking God's holy law and his holy character is that Jesus would go, you know what? This can only be dealt with in one way, and that is that I stand in the place of this person, and I take on their punishment instead of them taking it on. And we're like, yeah, cool, okay, yeah, Jesus, thanks, cool, I'm out. And then God's like, you should be rich towards me. How dare you, God? This is my money. I earned this. This is, this is, why, why would you ask for something like this? This is ridiculous. 
We're like, sure, best of heaven, this amazing father God who would, who would give his firstborn, the darling of heaven, the perfect God man who would, who would give everything and empty himself out even to the point of death so that he could redeem us who were not very good. And you think about it in your own past and you're like, man, there's some things that Jesus took on for me that I'm pretty ashamed about. I don't, I, I, I feel bad that the, the sinless son of heaven would take on some of the things that I've done. And then in return, he's like, okay, I've given you my life. I've given you everything in my creation. I've given you of my spirit. I've given you my own family, my own flesh and blood. I've taken your sins on. Why don't you be a part of the church, part of the family, and really share what you have? No way. God, that's ridiculous. This is America. How are you rich toward God? You go from, from being us versus them. There's they. The church is trying to get my money. God just wants to take my stuff. Well, as long as the church doesn't include you, it'll always be them, not us. Not, wow, I, I came into this place and my life was changed and God radically transformed my heart and everything that I am and everything that I make belongs to him. And this thing that we are doing together is awesome and it's great. And I'm privileged to just be a part of it. I think that that's the attitude that we should have. And I get it. It's difficult. It's difficult because we're human beings and we want to be rich towards ourselves and not rich towards God. And this is what you have to answer for, and this is what I have to answer for. I'm not exempt from this. I, I don't get to, like, pastor the church and, and not give my money and my time and all of that. We do, and we love it because we really believe that this is the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus that are doing his mission on the earth. And when you're in that and you are a part of that, it becomes a real easy thing to say, what can I give to you, my God? And you might be here, and you might not be a part of it. You might not be consider yourself a Christian, and, and that's okay. You're invited here. You're welcome here. But we want to give you the opportunity to become one. And if you're here today and you say, how do I do that? How do I sign up? How do I get into this family, this family of God? Well, all it takes is everything you have. Giving God your life and saying, you know what, God? I know that I don't, I don't deserve this. I know that I've done things that are wrong. I know that I have I've been places and done things and seen things, and, and I have willingly just gone into sin and brokenness and baggage, and I've just gobbled it up for myself. And it just, it, it's only ever brought me brokenness and pain and darkness. And the things that I thought were going to turn out great and the things that I thought were going to satisfy and they were going to bring me pleasure, they brought me pain. They brought me this just lostness, this, this brokenness, this distance. And oftentimes the, the message of God is counterintuitive. We don't, we don't think of it as being true because we're, we're human. The story of the Bible explains this, that sin, it broke us. It broke our way of thinking. It broke our way of even relating to God to even thinking about God in the right way. And coming back to God is not just kind of a cerebral, you know, ascent. Like, okay, yeah, I guess I believe in you. That's fine. Let's go on. It's, it's, it's uh, every part of you. It's you as a whole person. It's holistic. It's, it's your heart and your mind and your emotions and your will and your money. And you're saying, God, you have done and want to do something for me that I have, I, 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 I absolutely need. I don't want to live for myself. I don't want everything in life to be about me, me, me. And at the end, when it's finally my soul is required of me, and I live completely for self, and I show up and, and, and you look at me, God, and you say, well, you live completely for you. Why don't you just continue leaving, living completely for you? There's a place for that. But in God's family, he says, come in and everything's yours. The pantry is open. The fridge is open. How many of you like having parents where the, the pantry is open? Hey, yo, I'm telling you. And I think that that's how God is but it requires giving everything to him first. Saying, God, you've provided everything. You built it all. You created it all. You give freely. I'm going to give as freely as you. And if you go, boy, I want to be a part of that family. I want to be a part of the family of God. 
I'd invite you to do that. I'd invite you to pray this prayer after me. Just repeat after me. It's simple. Dear Jesus, I know that I need you. I know that I can't be holy apart from you. It requires your life and your blood and your work on the cross. I'll accept your life. I know that I need it. I know that I need you. I can't be whole alone. And so I repent. I turn from my sin. I hate my sin. It's never brought any good, and it never will. But if you'll cleanse me, if you'll change my heart, I'll walk with you. I want to be like you in your family. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to pray a general prayer for all of us, and then we'll dismiss. God, thank you so much that you're a giver. Thank you that you're not stingy. You're not cheap. But God, even the way that you decorate your creation, the way that you think about your children, it's always from a place of riches and wealth and abundance. God, if we've learned to be cheap, even while being prosperous, if we've learned to hold on to everything we have when you don't, God, we're not a reflection of you. And we want to reflect you. God, we know that you're generous and you're good and you're fair. And we want to be like you. Thank you so much that you bless your children. Thank you so much that you care for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.